Welcome to another episode of our COVID Conversations. Uh, the, today, we're, we're joined by Nick Binadel. Nick is one of the uh, most prominent um, academics in, is throughout the African continent, uh, having been the, the uh, founder or founding dean of uh, the Gordon Institute of Business Sciences, uh, a pioneering institution that, that's part of the University of Pretoria in South Africa, and more generally, uh, an advisor um, to CEOs, presidents, uh, ministers, uh, not only in South Africa, but around the world, and also uh, a friend of our, our school at London Business School and the Wheeler Institute in particular, uh, Nick, uh, every year joins our MBA students in South Africa uh, to give them a bit of context about, uh, about not only the country, but also what it means for the world. So it's a particular delight to welcome Nick uh, because uh, he has this unique ability to, to put things in context, uh, share uh, the insights not of, of the reality of, of business and society uh, and leadership, not only from the view from the top, uh, but also from the ground up. Uh, Nick, absolute delight to have you back. Uh, how are you doing? I'm, I'm well, Rajesh, dealing with these turbulent times. Thank you. I suppose having come out of uh, a South African history and thinking back to the 80s when life was extremely turbulent, uh, we have experienced these kind of challenges before, though these are completely unprecedented and different. I, I have moments where, where I'm very, very concerned and unclear about how this is all going to work out for everybody. But in general, I'm good and uh, very, very busy. Thank you. Oh. And, and, and you're safe and uh, all family and friends are okay for now. Yeah. So far, so good. <laughs> That's great. Um, so today uh, is the 1st of May. Uh, South Africa is just sort of nudging open or cracking open the doors a bit in its uh, rather extraordinary lockdown rel relative to other parts of the world where uh, quite a few uh, of the realities of daily life have been locked down. Can you talk a bit about uh, what that has implied in terms of the challenges? We'll come later on to um, what some solutions might be, what you're observing and what you think uh, should be, both from a perspective of, uh, of decision makers who have great influence, but also uh, from the perspective of uh, those on the ground. But let's start with the challenges. Uh, what have you seen so far, uh, especially as you look at the world through South African eyes? Well, I mean, first to say the president, President Ramaphosa, made a quite early and emphatic decision with his cabinet uh, to create this lockdown of the economy. And uh, it's very hard to tell as we historians will all dig out how each country handled this. But ours was pretty emphatic. So we literally shut down the economy and movement. Yeah. Unlike many other economies who could support its workforce, uh, South Africa doesn't have the financial resources to do so. So this was a very, very brave and difficult decision. Um, and as you know, and many would know, that before the breakdown, before the lockdown, South Africa's economy was already in a very difficult situation. So this has been an added uh, impact. And uh, if you study the structure of our economy, we're one of the most unequal in the world. We have a very, very high unemployment rate. And so this really was a shock to the economy apart from the medical and social issues. So it was a dramatic choice. Uh, he put human life ahead of economic life. Um, and as, you, as you've just indicated, we've now gone to, in today is the first day of the first phase where beyond running essential businesses, we're now starting to open up the economy a little bit in mining and manufacturing and so on. Um, so it's been a well-managed uh, well policy yeah. The difficulty in South Africa is execution on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, the army have been called out to assist. They haven't been trained to do this well. The police have been trying to manage the lockdown. It's not easy. And South Africans have a, a long history of resilience, but also of defiance. <laughs> so the struggle led to a really tough-minded attitude. And in the, in the poor communities I've been working in, delivering food and helping both at the 40,000 feet level, but also on the ground, uh, I would say the lockdown was only being partially effective. I want to thank you. Now, I want to come back to a couple of points you made. You, you mentioned the indeed brave 
uh, and difficult uh, decisions made by the president and other local government um, in response to this crisis. And South Africa has been a leader on many dimensions uh, in its history. Uh, with respect to, for instance, the HIV crisis, it was not. And perhaps uh, some of that uh, uh, experience is, is reflected in, in, in that response. What are you finding in terms of um, the reaction of both those in the um, business community um, and especially those in large businesses, um, as well as, uh, as you said, resilience and resistance or, or, or you know, unwilling, unwillingness to take things uh, for granted. Um, but what does that mean in terms of response as well? So, Start with the big so stuff. That's a, yes. that's a very good question. Um, as you know, South Africa is a corporate economy. Yeah. It's got quite a weak SME economy. And so corporate South Africa is really the strength of our economy. And what has happened in the last few months is business and government have really cooperated together. Really? So we've launched a, a solidarity fund where individuals and companies have put hundreds of millions of dollars into a well, hundreds of millions of rands uh, and many millions of dollars into a fund to assist manage the process, to keep businesses afloat and to assist in terms of food and so on. So there's emerged a very good partnership. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm involved in a group called the Public Private Growth Initiative, which has been running for two years. We converted that into helping give guidance to the presidency and cabinet about the regulatory environment under which we would define essential services and now begin opening up what we're calling a risk adjusted phasing to the opening of the economy. So the relationship has been very good. And uh, although there are many criticisms and the public and so on have comments, uh, we, we made the decision to ban the sale of cigarettes, which was very unusual in the world. The president announced that uh, we'd lift the ban the minister announced a day later we weren't going to lift the ban. So, you know, it's not all straightforward and straight sailing, but I have to say both business and government have been decisive and business in general has been very generous in supporting uh, the social needs because government has very little in the fiscus to spend. Uh, I, I want to come back to that. Uh, you, but since you mentioned cigarettes and alcohol, right, and which is a whole other conversation, which in, in the UK, um, alcohol is, is now deemed an essential service, uh, so, uh, <laughs> so wine stores uh, are, are allowed to stay open. Um, well, we, we are exporting our wine, but we're not allowed to drink it. <laughs> I have been a, a happy beneficiary of South African wine, I must say, in these last few days. But back to your point about business. So you mentioned this fund that has been created um, to, to help, um, especially with these essential and urgent needs. What else, what, what other role does business have in a moment like this? I know you've been a leader in pointing out uh, the very unique responsibilities uh, that especially large firms have in a, in, in, around the world, uh, but uniquely so in a place like South Africa for the reasons you mentioned. Now here we are, you know, in a situation that, uh, that nobody had wished for or expected even, and, 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 even we thought we had seen the bottom and apparently we had not. Uh, what is the role of business um, in a situation, in big business, corporate uh, business, South Africa, uh, in a situation like this? Besides the so, so some companies, of course, in some industries have been hit extremely hard. They've gone from thriving sectors like tourism uh, to zero, as has happened all around the world. And so it's support to see what we can do to support those most vulnerable. And some of the big companies are gonna come under cash flow pressure because the big companies have undertaken to keep paying employees in the meantime. Unlike in Europe where government is subsidizing yeah. employee salaries, we, we just don't have the resources to do that. So there is gonna be a moment out there in the next 60, 90 days where that becomes an issue. What government have done is increase the social grant. It's a small grant, but it's a survival grant. And then what business has done is contributed these funds to assist. Um, and that's been fairly successful. I was worried uh, a week or two ago that we might find literally starvation, and that's extraordinary in a wealthy country uh, and, and, and for that to happen. But we've overcome much of the logistics, mainly through NGOs, civil society and business have worked together very closely in the last two months. So uh, I'm sure the critics would say business should do more, 
Um, I think there's an interesting debate that we're starting to have about the role of business between financial capitalism, the shareholder model, which has been the dominant logic in South Africa, and a more developmental form of capitalism where business is, owns and embeds itself in the life of the nation. Mm. A friend of mine said to me an interesting thing about uh, this time in South Africa. You know, we've had 25 years of democracy. Uh, given our history, it was a remarkable achievement. We've had free and fair elections and government performs and does what it can. But this is a test of whether the country can be a nation and where the business and government and civil society figure out they need each other and therefore their prospects for a newer, higher level moral partnership where business is really seen as part of the fabric of, of the country. And uh, some people and some companies have been extremely generous in, in realizing that this inequality is an immoral problem. Um, so I think there's the potential for a new debate. Uh, the problem is that government and business is really focused on short-term survival, but we're beginning to think about in phase three or phase four, uh, how do we think about restructuring this economy to make it fairer, to make it more inclusive, and to try and decrease this catastrophic and growing inequality that we've had in South Africa in a democracy. And of course, the left is pushing in one angle, and let's call it the right, uh, or the center is pushing in another. And we'll see if we have national leadership that are able to construct a kind of new form of social contract. It's not just simply about restarting the old engine. It's about can we redesign some of the fundamentals because we've gone to ground zero in so many ways. And uh, to, to your point about uh, um, stakeholder capitalism and uh, going beyond shareholders, you know, one of the greatest um, one of the greatest contributions of business to society is uh, the ability to offer millions of people a good, steady, um, dignify, dignity offering job. And if the businesses, as you mentioned, uh, remain uh, in a position uh, and or uh, able to uh, and willing to sustain that, that would truly be uh, meaningful, far more than a, a CSR effort in some ways, uh, in a moment of great national need. Well, I think there, there are three layers to this uh, economy in a way. South Africa is a highly sophisticated financial market, stock exchange, etc. Yeah. But it's really professional services that are really world class. And then it has a second layer, and then this third layer of, of the majority of South Africans, one has to say, who either earn their income informally, uh, they casual laborers, they contract workers, and that's where the pain is really being felt now. I don't see us having the resources to fundamentally transform all of this, like pulling a rabbit out of a hat. We're dealing with a structure that has emerged over hundreds of years and decades and it's very hard to reform this because there's an ideological dogmatism that has shaped the debate very often. And then there's a structural reality about the nature of wealth. So if government takes progressive moves too far to the so-called left, if you like, uh, business and capital will shrink back from investing and will feel threatened. And if government sits in the middle and doesn't do some of the progressive things that need to be done, um, the, the, the people, the voters will take umbrage ultimately. Mm. And so what the president is doing, I think so far very effective, is talking to both constituents and managing to create, for the first time, I think in many years since Nelson Mandela, a kind of common consensus. Mm. And in general, he is very popular for having been pragmatic, for being humanitarian in his approach, and for communicating so steadfastly the approach and uh, we've had expert advice from our medical uh, scientists and we've we've managed to get that across and uh, uh, at least outside uh, what one hears is about when other countries are struggling with politicians refusing to listen to um, scientific advice or or uh, or you know, going the wrong way. Um, and South Africa has a history of having done that in the past. Uh, here, those very same individuals who did not get a hearing in the past uh, are now actively shaping uh, the response uh, of South Africa. Right, right. 
and, and remarkably for all of the twists and turns um, of South African uh, politics, policy, society, it seems like, uh, at least as an outsider, one senses a greater level of trust in, uh, um, the, in the uh, folks involved in medical decisions. Well, well, it's very newly emerged because mm -hmm. six months ago, many South Africans, including the middle class, were doubting the leadership style of, of Sir Ramaphosa. They mm -hmm. felt he wasn't decisive enough, he wasn't making clear decisions, he wasn't taking action on corruption enough. Actually, what we've seen is a, a president who's had a remarkable history. Here's a man who built the largest union in the world after the Second World War. He was Secretary General of the ANC. He's been a business person. He's been the, the deputy president. So he's had a remarkable mix of experiences that have all now come to the fore. I think the point I wanted to say about this different response as opposed to the AIDS denialism under President Mbeki is how leaders frame the problem early becomes mm. absolutely decisive um, because the president has authority. So we implemented the Disaster Management Act and he sees the initiative by shaping and framing the problem. When I you, think a lot of leaders wait for the problem to emerge and they're not sure they're like a, a, a rabbit in the headlights. And Ramaphosa demonstrated clarity about this firmness that won him a lot of support in cabinet and elsewhere. When you say he framed it early on a certain way, what do you mean? Can you elaborate on that? Uh, on the well, well, you know, as we watched, uh, as we, we were slightly lagging. Hmm. So we had a sort of three week lag to see the data. And we saw the difference between countries that locked down and those that didn't. Hmm. And he firmly seized on the idea with medical advice, that it would be the right thing to do to impose this very severe shock on the economy. And we will only know in years to come whether that was the yeah. right decision or not, but it was a decisive, uh, it was a decisive moment and he made a decision, as yeah. did the cabinet. And that's what we're living through now. Yeah. Now, I want to go from the sort of lofty heights of, uh, of residents and, and CEOs to um, those on, in the, in, on the ground, the grassroots, um, as well as MBA students, as a, as a, a professor uh, and uh, someone who many, I know uh, for a fact, uh, many students, including our own uh, at London Business School, look up to. Uh, let me start with the MBA students and then I, I want to hear about your thoughts, having uh, been involved in some of those uh, food delivery uh, initiatives, among others, what you think. Um, but the MBA students, those who are coming up, you know, going through their formative business training in this moment. Um, what should they be thinking? What should they be doing? Uh, how should they, how is and how should this experience shape their thinking and actions in the years to come? So I think the first thing is that the overwhelming majority of our students are part-time. Mm -hmm. And what we had to do is shut down the campus and we we're a face-to-face -face environment, and we had to move over about four weeks into a, a form of digital access, and we had to pick a technology that would be accessible to all our students, which was uh, interesting, because we had to pick a, 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 not the best technology for the minority, but the best technology for all. Mm -hmm. And we then moved, we opened on Monday, all our programs are now open, and the faculty then had to switch into this form of learning. So the faculty have been scurrying around learning how to maximally teach in, in this technology. I think the students also, of course, because they're part-time, have been dealing with the total change in their work environment and learning to work at, from home with all the challenges that we all have been talking about. And this is a particularly big challenge for leaders because you've lost the face-to-face if you know your team, that's fine, but you've lost the sort of impact and the research is showing that, that the, the Zoom meetings that we're all doing are exhausting meetings because you've lost something that's almost hard to define. Yeah. And they're dealing with all the other social pressures of being at home, our kids have been on holiday, so MBAs, uh, as they always are, are having to juggle all those balls, yeah. learn to learn in a different mode, uh, receive from faculty whatever we're doing in a different mode, and then doing their jobs and dealing with this new social environment. So that adds up to a lot of pain, which hopefully will lead to a lot of gain. 
which is assumptions that we all hold so dear about how life is and what work is and how our economies and companies should function have all been suspended and we've gone through the wormhole into a new world and we don't know what that new world's going to come out uh, in all its facets. And there are those who think it's all going to get back to normal and then there are people who say it'll never be the same. They live, we all living moment by moment and that puts yeah. a lot of psychological uh, pressure on the MBAs. So far from what we've seen, there's been a very good response. And everyone realizes we're in the same boat. So there's a high level of cooperation, very little criticism of what the decisions the school has made. So that's gone pretty, pretty well. If I talk a bit about on the ground, I sort of got zoomed out eventually after so many policy discussions that we were having, because the group I'm part of, the presidency asked us to advise them. So we did, and we had countless meetings with government, uh, with the president himself, and then with ministers and, and executives in government, and then with civil society, where I'm also connected, uh, many, many meetings about the issue, what's to be done, etc. But I found I reached a point where I had to, I had to do something rather than talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so a few of us got together and started raising funds for food parcel delivery. One of the dilemmas in South Africa is we have a very large migrant population, many of whom are not registered, and the government policy has largely been not to feed them. And these are many of the casual informal laborers I was referring to earlier. Okay. So we set about supporting them on Can the ground. Clarify, Nick, do you mean migrant yes. in the sense of migrating from the rest of, part of South Africa outside, or outside? From outside. Outside, yep. So Papuans and, and so on. Yes. And so uh, we, we raised funds and that got me into these communities. Uh, in fact, the video we took of 5,000 people lining up in a totally disciplined way two days ago has gone totally viral all over the world wow. uh, because we delivered 6,000 parcels into a 40,000 person community, an informal settlement like a favela, and there was total discipline. And so we're raising the funds to keep them fed. And it's to keep okay, them we'll share that on our website. Yeah. I, you're welcome to it. And, and I've just spent the morning in there. Um, and, you know, it's amazing the poverty these people are living under. And they're the ones who've really lost their income. So uh, the support for them. And we, we're beginning to change the government's attitude uh, to supporting them as well. It's a humanitarian question. I felt very morally compromised that I was a citizen of a country that allowed people in, but when there was a crisis, wasn't prepared to support them. Mm -hmm. So we've been getting that message across. That's wonderful. Yeah, and, and some of the, as you know, we go, we, we visit uh, uh, South Africa once a year from, uh, from uh, uh, LDS, and, uh, and we've always been welcomed uh, warmly by those in Alexander Township, and we see just how incredibly diverse um, the, the Rainbow Nation actually in, includes many nations, uh, uh, and, and that is certainly evident in South Africa, so I'm wonderfully... Uh, I'm, I'm so grateful that you're, you're, you're doing this. Nick, a final question before we let you get on with the other work you're doing. Uh, would the, what lessons would you offer given your experience uh, as a global scholar? Um, what lessons would you offer from this experience in South Africa to those outside South Africa? What lessons... Uh, uh, does the South African um, uh, response um, and uh, sort of near-term uh, expectation imply for the rest of the world? So it's a very difficult question to answer because I think all of us are going through a similar macro environment. Uh, you know, the same stresses and strains are, but the outcomes are different depending on two things. What's your situation going in? and what choices you make while you're in it. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if South Africa has any unique lessons to learn. I think there are many countries with similar demographics, economics, and politics as us. I don't think there's one thing that stands out. If there is, it's that we've had troubled times in our recent history. Yeah. And we've come together as a constitutional democracy, which most of the world thought was quite remarkable. And what I see as being very interesting in this process is the opportunity to create a, a nation out of a country, to create a commonness, an understanding of the need for each other, the role that everybody plays. And maybe the lesson is to abandon how you've got in the room. And what I often say is, you know, how we've got in the room and what we're doing in the room is not how we're going to get out of the room. 
So you can take the lessons from the past and, and see which of them are useful, but you have to have a realistic grip on the current reality. And then you've got to start shaping next as a leader. And this is very, very hard work. I, I've been talking to CEOs of companies who accept that they've had to mask some of their own emotions because we do face with very significant layoffs. One of our big giant uh, retailers uh, is closing down. Our airline is in business rescue. The national airline has been going for 80 years. So there's some very hard choices. And so leaders tend to put on a good mask. We're trying to help them make sure that they can manage their own emotions. And what I've learned is there are three things. There's your emotional entry into it, why I got so active on the ground. It helped me cope with the policy stuff because I felt emotionally that I was dealing with the real issue in a very small way. Mm. Secondly, there's the physical action of getting out and engaging with people and, and seeing their responses to the help they get, which is very motivating. And then thirdly, there's the intellectual challenge of defining the issues that are in front of you mm. in a way that are insightful and useful to others so that you're framing what the organization is doing appropriately. I've been working with one big company where the CEO has just simply been outstanding because his, his daily communication to the entire company uh, opens up uh, for discussion all the time. The dean of the business school has a Zoom call every day, 15 minutes for all the staff. Um, so that sort of direct personal communication to show people that you are in the battle, you're as vulnerable as they are, maybe not quite as vulnerable if you're a highly paid executive, but still you are in the battle and that you're at the front of the battle and that, that you will assist them to get through this tough process. I think that's a kind of a spirit of the best of South Africa. And you witnessed it when we won the World Rugby against uh, England. That's a joke. It's, <laughs> it, it's true. And, and just to underline something you mentioned earlier, societies around the world are coming together in a, in a sense of solidarity that very often um, has been uh, missing where we see differences uh, among each other. And now we see, my God, we're all uh, in this together. On the other hand, there have been uh, worries. In fact, my colleague Elias, who you know, uh, is doing some remarkable work about how um, far right or uh, extremist movements or politicians uh, uh, are harnessing uh, these what is happening right now to their own uh, end. Mm. And uh, what, what you've described to us about South Africa gives me hope uh, that um, despite the very difficult, especially, I mean, South Africa's had a difficult history more generally, but, um, but the last few years have not been easy either. And um, if uh, a, a horrible crisis like this can lead to good outcomes in South Africa, um, can lead to, lead to greater trust in institutions uh, in South Africa. That would be a great gift to the rest of the world, not least to South Africa, but the uh, rest of the world as well. And with that, Nick, we should let you go. Uh, and thank you for your gift uh, of time and insights. I always learn something when I speak with you. Thanks so much, Rajesh. And, and good luck to you and LBS on uh, figuring your way and this kind of contribution which is, is really needed. We're, we're all looking for guidance. So thank you for providing the uh, platform for all of us. Thank you. And that's the perfect cue for me to note to those listening and watching that uh, there, are may, uh, there are more um, insights in our COVID conversations uh, page. Uh, so please check those out. Uh, there are articles, there are background materials, uh, and we'll be having many more such conversations. So Nick, thank you. Stay safe and speak to you soon. A pleasure.